The implication of the human genome is that in my theory of the five principles of organized complexity, where I describe the human genome as the piecing together of segments of the infinite K pattern, and the infinite K pattern is the distribution of prime numbers. That's what it is. Now, on my podcast on memory and the human genome, genes and the human genome, I talked about how the human genome is composed of these segments, and that what we call a human being, or even life in general that uses DNA, what we call that is that different aspects of the K pattern are interacting with themselves. They are interacting. So the K pattern becomes a system that is interacting with various scaled copies of itself. And as a human genome, uh, because the human genome is 6 billion units long, and I, my theory is that this 6 billion units was obtained from a sequence that is 36 billion units long at a minimum. Okay. Now, like a, a transformer internal coil wiring. You know, if you open a transformer and you look at it, the way that it's wired, or even not just a transformer, a motor. You see, an induction motor. There's a way that the core, right, is wired. That is the way, in similar an analogical terms, that is the way that a K pattern wires to itself. So it can start off as maybe at the 24th billion unit and wire itself all the way and connect all the way to maybe the 23rd billion unit, you know, whatever. But these are loops. And when I drew, when you see my book and you uh, look at, you, know, you read my book, I drew the general representation of the K pattern. And that representation are these loops that come in among themselves. They interact with themselves. So you can imagine a sequence, you know, think about a film, a movie that is a few, uh, whatever long, maybe an, two hours long. Imagine our 160 interacting with our 150 and then our 150 interacting with our 159 and uh, our 159 interacting with or point 159 rather or minute 159 rather interacting with minute two and minute two interacting with minute you know that's how stories are written you know when you when you watch a movie you're watching a series of plots as they develop and the way that these narratives develop is they don't develop in exact linear sequences the more intriguing stories they cut across time and space and they weave a narrative that is compelling the most compelling stories the most uh, entertaining stories are the ones that do very well but that is the nature of the wiring of the K pattern. That wiring, the, the picture of that wiring, or the image, or the representation, or the projection of that wiring, is what the a genome is. Now, the human genome is obviously uh, uh, contains the ability to wire a brain, to build a brain, a human brain, and then wire it. So there's something uniquely uh, distinct about it, and that is down to the organization the nature of the patterns of those wires and the loops that are formed. Now, for the human being, I conjecture that the loops are faithful representations of the K pattern. And that allows the human being to experience itself as the K pattern. And that experience of itself as a K pattern, that is what it means to be self-aware. I have so many podcasts where I've talked about this. So any one of them you pick, you get a general, a general description of what this process really is. But what I want to talk about today is something I like to call conformational gradient theory. And it's, it's my idea regarding how thoughts are formed in the human brain. Now, if you've been following my podcast, especially the one on memory and, and genes and, and, uh, the one on, um, glucose and amino acids and also the one on uh, cosmic inflation, the theme that runs through all of this is that I talk about the symbolic representation of organized complexity, which is the six, and how these are, you know, in three-dimensional rea reality, are really pulses of three sixes, and that these organize complexity. That's basically what it is. That's the essence of my theory. And I call the infinite uh, sequence or the infinite distribution of this pattern, I call it a K-pattern. 
and I, I named that terminology in my book, uh, the five principles of organized complexity. Conformational gradient theory. And the idea behind it is that um, our genome, genomes in general, they are instructional sets of some kind. So, but they are instructional sets that don't only code for end products. They code for the warehouse, the manufacturing facility itself, and all the tools that are being used in the manufacturing facility that takes place within the cell as they produce proteins. But in order to produce proteins, they need to produce the things that produce proteins. Then they need to produce the things that produce the things that produce proteins, all the way down to the base level mechanics. The very first things that uh, that start the uh, uh, production process itself, which are the things that actually unzip the DNA. Okay, so that you can now have a, a a segment of RNA that you know that now forms the template upon which uh, protein is built. But in the end, proteins are conformational shapes. That's really what they are. A protein is specified not just by the sequence of amino acids, but by its folding, the way that a, fo a protein folds. And every aspect of this process carries information. There's no aspect that is not useful. The biology uses every aspect of the formation of a protein to link into other processes. So it's not just the shape of a protein. It's the way that it's, it folds, is the, what exactly makes up the protein. Everything about the protein but is, is useful. But in the long run, you can you know, think of a protein as a functional key. And the idea of a functional key is that it fits into a lock. But proteins also build that lock. So the idea of, of conformational theory is that things change shapes. Now, in every nucleus of a brain cell, you know, manufacturing is going on. And what is being manufactured are proteins. So the idea of genetic expression means that there are certain sequences in protein production that are favored or are activated while others are dormant. And then at other times, other sequences are activated while others are dormant. Now, how the cell knows what to express is still a scientific mystery. I mean, they, they studied detailed processes, but the full picture is not clear yet. Where does this, how does the cell know what to produce, which genes to activate? Well, that information is coming from the, from the sense organs. And, you know, we know of five sense organs that interface with what we call external reality. But every aspect of the body is signaling. Every cell, average now 50 trillion cells per human being, every member of that 50 trillion cell community is signaling. So it is receiving signals from its local environment and also sending out signals to everything else. So in order to be able to carry out this signaling, there is a manufacturing hub right in the cell there that is producing these proteins to go out there and do functional, some type of functional task. Now, in my book, The Five Principles of Organized Complexity, I call the creation of these functional uh, engines uh, prescriptive knowledge spaces because everything is done by prescription. It's not a... Uh, it, these things are happening in real time very quickly, very fast. And take, for instance, in your head. You know, uh, in my podcast on uh, memory... I talked about how every thought in the brain is a new protein of some kind, some type of protein expression. So that every time you have, every wakeful moment, including the thoughts that you have during those wakeful moments, conform to three-dimensional shapes that are being created spontaneously in your brain by all the cells, all the brain cells in your head. They're each producing a stupendous amount of proteins, and each protein corresponds to uh, the next momentary uh, pulse in your awareness, if you want to call it that. So the question now becomes, you see a sight, you feel some way about what you have seen, and all the other senses gather that information from that sight to register a composite view of perception and immediately just for you to perceive that object that you have seen or the sight you have seen and to understand what it means they are detailed conformational changes in the shapes produced in your head each shape corresponding to a unit moment 
of that perception. The fact that you can actually remember or recall your perception means that these shapes are not lost in the conformational changes. Somehow, there is something keeping track of these conformational changes as they occur all over the brain. So you can think of these conformational changes as shapes. So, and each time you perceive something and you understand what it is, you are producing a correspondent conformational shape in your head that plugs into the existing chemistry of your brain, which is the overall conformational uh, soup that your brain is immersed in all the time. And this is being carried out by all sorts of neurotransmitters, all sorts of synapse firing. Everything is going on in real time. But at the end of the day, you can simplify everything to the production of shapes. Okay? And key shapes need to fit into functional locks or functional keys need to fit into functional locks. And then the next batch of production in the very next minute, they need to fit into two. And so everything is is being created in real all the proteins are being created in real time and they're fitting like lego blocks have you ever played the game tetris just imagine it's something like tetris you know blocks fitting into each other in real time so there's a spontaneous production and it's ongoing minute by minute there there are this there, there are the production processes that maintain the sense of self-awareness itself even when you're probably not thinking about anything in particular and so what you're perceiving as a sense of self going forward are conformational changes in your head. That is, three-dimensional shapes being created spontaneously, locking into existing shapes, new shapes being created, locking into existing shapes, and on and on it goes like that. Now, the way that the cell, the neuron, knows how to produce the shape, where does it get this information from? Because the shape is produced by activating certain aspects of your genome. So in, in, in the end, it boils down to various aspects of the genome interacting with various copies of itself. It's the behavior of the K pattern itself. If you've been listening to my podcast, you will clearly hear that is the way I describe it all the time. A system interacting with infinitely various scaled copies of itself. So it's self-interaction, but it's... The way that this happens, it happens on an infinite number of gradients. And that's why I call it confirmational gradient theory. Because that's really what it is. So that each perception, right, is a change, or the production and manufacturing of, it, of, its, of a particular shape that fits into existing shapes, and on and on it goes like that. Now, what is guiding this process? And how does the cell know? Now, the cell itself, when you... When it receives stimuli from your sense organs, I don't know, from your eyes or whatever it is, and that goes into your, your, your cerebral cortex, okay, through your optic nerves or whatever, at the end of the day, that triggers the production of a very specific type of protein corresponding to the perception that you have just had. So the perception is represented as a, represented as a conformational shape. And so you can boil down, you can micro down every type of perception coming from all your sense organs into various types of very complex 3D shapes that are somehow locking into each other. And these shapes are being produced because various parts of your genome are interacting with themselves, different loops, cycling with themselves, certain products, certain parts of the genome expressing, certain parts being de-expressed or suppressed. And on and on it goes like that continuously, as long as you are alive. And that's why your brain uses 20% of all the glucose that is consumed in your body. Because it's, it's a continuous manufacturing plant. Okay? Now, what it simply means is that Every perception which you have corresponds to loops, self-interacting loops within the pattern of the K, within the segments of the K pattern that embody what you call a genome. So if you think of the infinite sequence of K patterns, which is the distribution of prime numbers, you see that certain aspects of the number systems are interacting with themselves. 
Now, how does the body know how to coordinate all of this process? It's because the body knows where every prime number is. And the only way it does that is that it counts. <laughs> That's really what it is. How do you think the system is controlled? It counts, and it counts in multiples of sixes. That's why everything in, your, in, in biology, everything in existence, pulses with those sixes. Because it is with those pulsations that everything in existence is able to keep track of everything else. That's how the entire system is bonded into unity. So that you as a living being, even though you are composed of 50 trillion cells, you are bonded as a unity. Your environment that you seem to be immersed in, that you seem to be participating in, and co-creating is bonded the physical laws of nature and that environment are bonded by those sixes so that they bond to your physics the physics of your own existence and that is the way the bonding occurs across all the hierarchies of scales all the way to this the the wholeness of the universe it's all down to those sixes because it is through the sixes that you perceive the essence of unity the five principles of organized complexity. That's really what it is. That's what it's saying. You can sum, you can boil down my entire discourse, my entire thesis, just into this. You think this is something new? No, it is not. The tetragrammaton, which you call the tetragrammaton in Judaism, that's exactly what it is. Through the six, you get unity. Through the six, you're able to perceive the oneness. By discovering the six, by being awoken to the six, you awaken into the oneness. That's really what it is. So this is a science that is, you can say that it's very new because some of the things I'm talking about, they're really very speculative from the point of view of mainstream science, right? But this has been known for thousands of years because otherwise, where did the name come from? The Tetragrammaton, where did it come from? You think the people who recognized the name didn't know what it was of course they did so what i'm saying is not it's not new per se it's very old extremely old it predates everything that we know today so if this level of understanding is thousands of years and thousands and thousands of years old then it's not really modern now is it hmm? an infinite system interacting with various scaled copies of itself that's how human consciousness is built that's how it manifests. That's the engine. That's the implementation of it because that is a cosmic principle. It is the underlying idea behind the five principles of organized complexity. That's evidence right there that the entire system is being controlled intelligently so that all the outcomes are prescribed. There are coincidences because some people will tell you that the emergence of human beings and the emergence of life is some type of coincidence it's not i once argued with someone that you have a lot of dead planets because even though it's being implemented you still need to obey this the system the rules through which the system is being created and that means that you need to permute so for every i don't know a billion dead planets you're going to have one like earth and that's why you need the vastness the scale of the universe of the galaxy you know I mean, the galaxy takes a light takes a hundred thousand years to cross from one end of it to the other why do you need a hundred thousand years to go from what kind of structure is that that's because of the scale you need to be able to implement the realization of what i'm explaining because it needs to be implemented as if there's nobody behind it as if there's nothing behind it otherwise how would you have free will how would you convince yourself that you are an autonomous creature operating according to your independent logic or independent thoughts? Nonsense. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as independence from what, if I may ask? From the laws of physics? From the laws of chemistry? From the laws of biology? From the laws, from the cosmic principles that, that give the universe, uh, uh, existence? Of course not. You, you're no more independent than that than, you know, than a brain cell or a, 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 a cell in your body is claiming independence. When cells behave like that, we call them cancers. They're tumors. Okay? It's not surprising that there is a word in Judaism called tumor. It's actually Hebrew, but a tumor is a, like a, a dysfunctionality of some kind. But that's exactly what it is. If you had a cell in your, in your body suddenly saying, I don't want to go with everything. I want to now be independent. That cell becomes a tumor. 
and spiritually there's also something like that you know tumor is a is a, a dysfunctionality in the the perception of existence and also the manifestation of that perception becomes like an an a waywardness of some kind a behavioral characteristic that doesn't fit into cosmic principle it's like a disturbance it's really noise okay and what do surgeons do they go in and they cut it off to restore homostasis because that is the cosmic principle the cosmic principle really is everything is one but this is not a religious concept this is not even a spiritual concept it's pure science, pure hardcore science. But you know, in science, you don't just have to assert, you have to be able to demonstrate and prove. Okay? And the proof will come, obviously, as people continue to engage in, in scientific thinking and continue to search for various elements of truth. They will definitely come across this. I don't have those tools to do this. I don't need them. Because I'm just podcasting, basically, okay? I'm theorizing. But the idea about the K pattern is that once you understand a small the smallest aspect of it, then you understand everything because everything connects to everything. You see? So back to the discourse proper. The changes that are taking place, because why use the word confirmation? What is a confirmational change? There is a there's a discourse called confirmational geometry where things change. Uh, st- structures and lengths change. You can stretch something and all that. But the thing that is preserved is the orientation of that thing. The angular measure of those things are preserved in conformational changes. Now, the reason why I call it conformational changes is because these 3D structures and shapes, they must fit into each other. And that means that there is a correspondence from one, from the creation of one protein to the creation of another protein. Otherwise, they wouldn't fit. And if they don't fit, that means that your thoughts are not coherent. Your moment to moment is no longer coherent. And if you have that on a grand scale, moment to moment incoherency, the person is said to have mental problems, mental illnesses, because they cannot operate as a single entity. They're disjointed. Now, I have a theory that says, a speculative theory that says that everybody is suffering from some type of mental disturbance or the other. Okay? But, you know, that's not what I'm talking about at this point in time. So, how do these structures keep track of, how do these shapes, these 3D shapes and structures, keep track of the uh, geometries that need to fit into each other? It's the principle of organized complexity. It's the six. Because the essence of the K pattern is that, despite the fact that it is infinite, every part is exactly where it is supposed to be. Every part of it is prescribed. There's no randomness, even though if you look at it on a large scale, it looks totally random. You would observe that if you look at the distribution of prime numbers on a one-dimensional line. It's totally chaotic. It's only when you view it from a 3D perspective by spectruming the the divisor structure that you you would see that it's not random at all. It's controlled by precise pulses of sixes that's really what it is and it is that which guides this complexity okay because it guides the infinite distribution so what is what is i mean a brain is not infinite it's finite no matter how complex it you it, it is it's still a finite system that is infinitely less complex than the k pattern itself because the k pattern is infinite so our thoughts what are our thoughts our thoughts are the production of these shapes these 3d shapes according to gradients of conformational geometry meaning they are an infinite number of these gradients and production takes place along the gradients but all the gradients have a relationship to each other that is also symbolic of the sixes because the pulses the three sixes they not only flow along the coordinate system they flow between the different gradients the different coordinate systems so that it looks like a coordinate system is vibrating infinitely often that's the classic structure of the k pattern 
because that is a system interacting with various scaled copies of what itself so it is self-interacting self-modifying and that is the nature of a coherent thought and remember if you couldn't have a co coherent thought you couldn't exemplify self-consciousness self-awareness there'd be no guiding principle for for thinking thinking is the guided process it's the, there's a reason why uh, human beings are separate or different from chimpanzees human beings can hold coherent logical thoughts they can infer they can count this is made possible by the gradients the conformational grade the conformal gradients that preserve this orientation the orientation is the relationship between the gradients because those orientations preserve the scaling the sixes and all of that's going on in your head that's why your cerebral cortex is divided into six layers there's so many other things i don't want to go you know i've talked about them in different po podcasts this your brain is literally a bioorganic representation in physical form of the k pattern so your brain is literally a, a graph if you ex if you could extend your cerebral cortex you know if you could unwind on on it's rolled up it's squeezed and folded up and all that if you could unfold it it's like a a sheet a graph all right and that graph has six layers and uh, wirings are projecting into those layers it's like a screen it's a six layered screen so reality is being projected on a six layered screen it's interesting because it could have been five it could have been eight ten why six that's a clue tells you that because if you your brain tries to faithfully represent what it perceives as a reality so that you can be able to engage with it in a way that can where you can understand it so it needs to reflect whatever dynamics if an external physical reality is supposed to be and that dynamics is the k pattern so it needs to be isomorphic to what it perceives as an external reality otherwise we couldn't understand it and if we couldn't understand it we couldn't be self-aware you understand that's really what it is so that's what our thoughts are our thoughts are changes changes in shape taking a 3d shape geometry taking place in our head and each change fits into a previous change and on and on it goes i mean obviously there are errors in this process errors must be generated because the scale and the complexity is really quite stupendous so we forget we don't really remember and because if the sixes are guiding this process then these sixes show up as some type of black pigment in your head those black pigments you know like for instance the substantia nigra right it's an aspect of the brain that is darker than all the other aspects it's very small whatever but they produce certain things one of that is a uh, eu melanin what that melanin is doing is acting as an organizing principle because we, it's those sixes that allow the sixes represented by the dark pigment allow everything to track everything else that's what it does now if you, you if you you know look at the brain and all that there are different areas some i mean the cerebral cortex is grayer than the white matter basically but you have different shades of 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 pigments in different parts of the brain signifying different functionalities basically but it is it is almost a rule of thumb if you say that the darker the aspect of the brain the more the control center it represents because it needs that black stuff to be able to guide complex organization complex conformation so as to be able to maintain the sense of unity for instance the substantia nigra once it begins to malfunction then the, the the patient begins to experience degrees of parkinsonism parkinson's disease because it allows the pigment that is produced there allows the coordination of impulses to motor neurons to allow coordinated movement so that movement acts as one parkinson's disease is basically movement out of sync 
it's no longer acting as one and all the other mental health men, brain disorders can really be traced down to this and i'm i have a podcast that is in the pipeline where i focus on these uh diseases parkinson's disease alzheimer's and uh and uh, dementia okay because what i want to do is to demonstrate the role of organized complexity in brain science in brain understanding that's really what it is so the interesting thing to note based on that is that your perception and the way that you gather information through your senses basically uh, corresponds to the conformal changes taking place within your head and this in turn corresponds to the system that is interacting with various scaled copies of itself as your genome in your genome and so uh, the first example I used when I began this narrative is to tell you about uh, stories. Basically, if you watch the plot of a movie or the plot of a story or any type of narrative, uh, the narratives are at, uh, arranged in patterns of self-interaction because it's one story. But, you know, the screen, the script writer might start with some time in the future and then jump back to the present and then jump. So, the point I'm making is that stories and narratives have their own internal consistency rules based on the quality of the plot, the qu uh, quantity of the plot, uh, you know, how long the plot is, and how the characters in the plot interact with each other. But all of this can be reduced down to the nature of a system interacting with various copies of itself. So in other words, stories basically behave like living things. It is in that sense that everybody's life is some type of narrative. That's why I do astrology. That's why I read natal charts. That's why I synthesize natal charts. Because in the synthesis of natal charts, in the synthesis of natal charts, uh, what you're really trying to decipher or what you're trying to extract is the narrative, the singular narrative that runs through the entire story. So you can take the internal complexity or internal consistency rules of any type of narrative and reduce it to a system of self-interact interactions. That is reflections and refractions. And you can do this with any type of story, especially compelling stories. So in other words, that means these uh, patterns, these trajectories or orbits encoded within stories Basically, when you internalize the story and you extract the meaning from the story, they become as perception. It's almost as if you are extracting the meaning of this story through your, your uh, senses, your sense organs. And that corresponds to interactions within your genome. So you can literally read your, read a story and rewrite your, the expression of your genome. You can suppress certain parts of it and activate certain other parts. This is incredible. But that's what we do every day, even without realizing it. So that we, the experiences we have as we experience the world is basically rewriting or or reactivating or deactivating parts of our genome. That's why when you expose a group of people to hundreds of years of torture and terrorism, and enslavement and brutality, you are rewriting their genomic expression because they begin to internalize all of those activities and they pass those rewrites to their offsprings so that there is the essence of what we call genetic memory. I know today science calls this study epigenetic. Science refused because of a lack of evidence, obviously, that such a thing was possible. Memory does not travel through the genes, through the genome, but it does. What is the genome if not encoded memory? But it's not a memory of individual events. It's the memory of this, re these relationships between perceptions. These 
patterns of self-interactivity that are encoded as a genome. Functional sites of such patterns, that's what we call genes. That's really what it is. And so if you take what's the most complex narrative, you know, what's, what are the most complex stories that we have today? You can take the story of, of, of the Torah, for instance, in the, the Bible, you know, the Old Testament of the Bible, the so-called Old Testament. And you see that within it is, within it there exists complex narratives, all sorts of stories. It's almost as if the whole thing doesn't make sense. It doesn't all link together. Sometimes people argue on the historicity of these, these things. These things have no historical value. They, they, they are not historical events. They are not a recording of past events. Their quality and their impact resides in the self-interactivity that is encoded as those narratives. Because those self-interactive aspects, because all it is is one narrative, but the narrative is interacting with itself. Okay? And the points, there are special points within those narratives, you know, which now becomes the representation of the deity. Okay, maybe the deity or God is talking to some individual and all that. These things encode, these are structures that literally by imbibing them, reading them, studying them, they begin to alter the expression of your genome. That's really what it is. It's no different from any other uh, stimulus, visual or auditory or whatever, or watching a movie. You know, when you watch a movie, what do you think is happening? The movie's success is dependent on how it can convince the viewer that they are actually an active participant in the story. It's called immersion. And the full uh, immersive experience is when the individual basically feels like they are in the story. But all of that is rewiring the genomic expression of the, of the viewer. That's really what it is. That's how nature works. But it's not, you know, like I said, it's not the individual memories that it's encoding. It is those points that are invariant in the narrative. So that you perceive over time the internal structure, the consistency rules of the narrative. Because that's the important thing about the narrative. It is the karmic structure of the, the narrative, the causative structure, the core, the linkages between cause and effect. That's what the brain assimilates, underlying the narrative itself. And this is what is imbibed as a uh, genomic expression, it, the patterns of genomic expression. And you know that the genomic expression, like I've said, is the activation and deactivation of different loops within the K-pattern. That's really what it is. So the story itself now becomes the activation and the deactivation of loops within the K-pattern, so that if you could see the narrative as it is reduced to these loops and these trajectories, you would see it as something similar to the what? The general representation of the K-pattern as demonstrated in my book, The Five Principles of Organized Complexity. Now, translate this thinking into the nature of trajectories and orbits. Because when people look at the solar system, what are they looking at? They're looking at some type of orbital structure where you have these planetary bodies following uh, predictable or prescribed orbits around a ball, a massive, massive ball of fire, illuminating the entire structure, providing the heat and the light and the warmth necessary for, you know, for the propagation of, of, of life, essentially. And as part of my teachings, I teach in my classes that when you look up at this orbital structure, which we call a solar system, you're not really looking at a solar system. It's not really a solar system. This is the representation of these dynamics that are self-interacting. 